Let me just go through 10 things that we see going on very quickly. So the first thing is the shift in power. You know, I'm sitting here, or we're sitting here in Singapore. I don't have to tell you about the shift to the east. But there's a shift, uh, meaning New York is the center of the world. Um, I mean, the Americans think that, and I agree with them, at least for the, for the, for the short term to medium term. And my view is it's a G2 world. Um, it's basically going to be dominated by the U.S. and China. I, I'm not in the camp that writes uh, America off. In fact, I'm the opposite. I think America has uh, a very strong future for two reasons. One is shale, uh, and on, although the oil price has come off, obviously, from over $100 to, uh, to $80, and may go lower, um, at least in the short term. Uh, shale, and then the <coughs> other thing, the other thing, big thing about advantage America has is uh, high capital intensive manufacturing. So robotics and 3D printing, two examples, mean that American manufacturing, instead of being uncompetitive because of the high price of labor, uh, becomes <coughs> very competitive because of the low cost of capital. I mean, I remember, the thing that I remember most actually was uh, sitting in front of a 3D printing machine and we're seeing a kid's car being 3, 3D printed. So it had a little base, a metallic base. And on top of the metallic base, it was 3D printed at the top of the car. And I said to the guy who did it after it came through after two hours, or two and a half hours, whatever it was, I said, is it possible to do this for, uh, for a, uh, a real car? And he said, well, it, it, his bet would be then in 10 or 15 years, whatever it was, you go into a dealership, so we're going to the JLR dealership, and we say, you know, you have a base, you say, print me a Land Rover. Uh, will print me a, a three, uh, the competitors of the three series, as Ralph, Ralph, Ralph uh, has that in mind. And um, the answer is it could be done, uh, in theory at least, and we'll see whether it gets done in practice. But this, if you think about the impact of that on, in terms of empl on employment, you know, it raises the hoary chestnut about whether the internet creates, um, or modern technologies create more employment, employment than they destroy, which <laughs> I'm somewhat somewhat concerned about. I think longer term we're going to have to get used to eating high levels of general unemployment for that reason. But no, there's no data really to support one thesis or the other. But basically I think it would be a G2 world and America actually is going to be in a strong position. <coughs> there's the shift from New York to the east, which you know about, to the south, to Latin America, and then the southeast, meaning Africa and the Middle East. So New York's, and I think London's position is really interesting in that. In that. You know, Boris is, you know, we're preceding Boris. So yesterday in Jakarta, um, you know, we were told that Boris is coming in. You're telling me that uh, Boris will be here uh, shortly with his delegation. And then he's going on to KL, I think. So um, we're not going to KL, we're going to Bangkok. But, um, you know, I think, I think the position of London as a, a global center with Singapore and New York is quite interesting. If I was running uh, a global company for the first time, I think those three centers, maybe with London as the global center actually, would be very interesting. We work quite closely with the EDB, uh, with Leo Yip, as he moves on to cyber security, uh, and Swan Jin comes, comes back to EDB, uh, or comes to EDB. Uh, we'll, we work with them on, on the positioning of uh, Singapore, as we do with Boris on the positioning of London, and with, we used to work with Mayor Bloomberg, and, in New York as well. So I think that sort of juxtaposition is quite interesting. But basically, the <coughs> shift of power from the old world to the, the new world, or I should say back to the future, because in the early 19th century, we're only going back to where we were in the early 19th century, actually, 40 to 50, when 40 to 50 percent of world GDP was there. The second thing that we see is, and take Ford as an example, um, what we see is the, the, the demand still is less than production. So if you take cars and trucks as a whole, there are 80 million units that car, that car manufacturers and truck manufacturers can produce. Uh, consumers can still only buy 60 million units, and which is uh, which is sort of a bit strange because you would think post Lehman, when two of the big three, so the Detroit big three, uh, GM and Chrysler, went into bankruptcy. If you remember, they went to Chapter 11. Both took government money. Ford was there, any manufacturer not to pay government money. And in those days, pre layman there were 80 million units could be produced, and only 60 million could be bought. Today, it's exactly the same. But what's happening is the pattern of demand has shifted dramatically. So the US was 
17 million units just before Lehman. It shrank to nine, it's now back to 16. China, I think this year is something like 22 or 23. Some people believe, although it's coming down, there's pressure in the Chinese market, some people believe it will go to 30, 32 million units. So there's a shift in the pattern of supply. And the other markets apart from China that have grown are South Korea and Japan, interestingly, a little bit, uh, because Japan has become much more competitive because of the, uh, the weakness in the yen, particularly recently. Uh, and so South Korea and India. Tata, the owner of uh, JLR, a nano car, which is a car that we launched in, uh, in India, the, 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 the cheaper car. So, so what's happened is the, 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 the supply balance has, has shifted, but the overall position is still the same. So differentiation, which is the business we, we in, is absolutely key. Being able to differentiate tangibly or intangibly is key. Coming back to that driving the top line, that again becomes critical. Differentiation. And the, the other thing related to, to demand and supply is where is the shortage? If there's an oversupply of production, there is undersupply of people. Um, you know, everybody's worried about the planet being too, too dense in terms of the number of people, six and a half or seven billion people, or whatever it's going to be in 10, 15, 20 years. But the, the interesting thing is that where there's a lack of, if you look at the demographics going out, in the future, there's going to be a lack of supply of people. You look at a country like Mexico or Pakistan. Pakistan has 185 million people, very young. Iran is, <coughs> Iran is a very young uh, population as well. And But if you look out 10, 15, 20 years, even the country like Mexico starts to age, just like it's the Russian problem, not as extreme, but the aging of the population. And as, as, life, uh, as life expectancy is elongated, as women, thank God, come more and more into the workforce, and you have two owner families, smaller family sizes, uh, what you're going to see is, is the demand for talent intensifying. So what we thought was a war for talent, standby is going to get uh, even more difficult. The third, uh, third issue we see is disintermediation of the web. I mean, the, if you said to me, what, in, what business is Google really in? It's really in the business of disruption. What, what they are trying to do is to shorten supply chains, basically. And, and for you and me as consumers, it means that we, we, we buy goods, we, we have access to goods, we have access uh, to services at lower prices. So from a consumer point of view, it's been obviously revolutionary. From a, from a legacy, from trying to run a legacy business, as most of the people in this room try to do, and ourselves included, it makes life very difficult because it means that the traditional business model that you have is, is threatened, it's disintermediated, it's disintermediated by a low-cost business model, and lastly, <coughs> and, and, not, and, and looping back to the talent point, these, these companies, we have a session with Facebook, uh, we have a, a, an online session with them at lunchtime today, I mean, Facebook's another good example, as there are uh, many others like Twitter, and what's happening, whatever. Uh, these are, these are companies that are more attractive to young talent. They're, they're less bureaucratic, they're smaller, they're more networked. You know, if you look at uh, the number of people that Google employs, I can't remember the, the figure, uh, but it's got a market cap now of uh, 400 billion around its, its number, I'm say number four in the world, I think, or number three in the world. Because Apple's number one, Exxon's two, I think. Microsoft is two. Sorry, Microsoft. sorry, you're right. Microsoft is now two. <laughs> so, uh, Sa no, absolutely right. Satya has now sort of driven the market value of Microsoft to number two. So number one would still be Apple, but just over 600. Microsoft is over 400. 400. Uh, Exxon, Exxon must be Slightly. slower than Three, that. Uh, and then number four would be Google. Number five, I'm going to say, would be uh, Alibaba. Alibaba is now about 300 billion, so in a very short period of time, it's gone to the level. So, um, in the post balma era, Microsoft has soared. So interesting. So he wins both ways. He has a basketball team, and he, he gets richer. Okay. So disintermediation on the talent point is the third point, um, and they're very attractive destinations for talent. The fourth area is, is, is <coughs> I think, is really interesting. Uh, is what's been happening with retail, the balance of power between retail and manufacturing. So for the last 20 years, manufacturers 
uh, have been have been under pressure from retailers. You, the rise of Walmart, the rise of Carrefour, uh, the rise of Tesco uh, over the last 20 years, they've had the control of the relationship with the consumer. For two reasons, that's changing. So, you know, we do a, a, a campaign with IBM, uh, done through Ogilvy, uh, on the called the Smarter Planet, Smarter Cities campaign. And that's on, based on the premise that 50% of the world live in cities today, and in 20 years, 30 years' time, 70% of the world will live in cities. Already in China, it's 50%. Uh, and most of the prognostications are 70% in a relatively short period of time. This means that urban living uh, is becoming more and more important. Congestion is uh, bigger and bigger issues. And what, what people want is uh, um, proximity shopping, convenient shopping. Very interesting, yesterday in Jakarta, a couple of the clients, big package goods clients, said to us, if you walked into stores today, not 15 or 20 years' time, and looked at pack sizes in convenience stores, you know, 7 and 11 type stores, you would find big uh, boxes of soap powder or uh, oil, cooking oil, or whatever it is. In other words, people are using convenience shops in their locality, in their neighborhood, to stock up, not going to big box anymore. Anybody you know, to get from uh, the airport to downtown Jakarta is two and a half hours, right? So, so it's a it's a appalling, and it's going to obviously going to get worse uh, before it gets better. Um, so, what will happen is you've got two earned families, less time, fewer kids, more more focus on on work and, and, and career, and as a result, they'll want convenient shopping, proximity shopping, and e-commerce. And coming back to the Alibaba thing, you know, we went and visited, Scott and I went and visited uh, Jack Ma in Hangzhou two years ago, Scott? Was that? Yeah. yeah, two years ago. And we came away thinking this guy was going to take over the world. Everybody thought we were lunatics. In fact, I remember, it's, it's, on, it's online actually, you can actually go and see it. We came out and said, this company's going to get floated at more than 200 billion. Today it's close to 277, 280 billion. Quite extraordinary. And, and don't forget, he has. It was actually at the Singapore summit here two years ago. I remember we talked about this. We'd just been to see Jack Ma, and um, he has he has the uh, Taobao platform, which is now about three hundred billion. In addition to that, he has a financial transactions platform, what now called Alipay, which is outside the float. And he and he said to us, I remember he said to Scott and I, we said, what are you going to do? Because he introduced us to his new CEO. He said, I'm going to do my good causes stuff, water, I think, it was, yeah. it was, it was and, I, and, and he's also going to tra uh, concentrate on the financial <coughs> transactions platform and the logistics platform, which is also excluded from the flow. Now we know that Alipay is going to be floated, he said a few weeks ago, it's going to be floated as a separate company. I thought it was going to roll it in after it started to make money. So, so what you're seeing is a shift in balance of power, I think, from retailer to, to manufacturer, driven by e-commerce phenomenon, phenomena like Alibaba and Amazon. Three companies to really think about in this space would be Google, Amazon, and Alibaba. Those are the three I think you have to really think about. And then, so you're gonna get a difference. Manufacturer and e-retailer re e are gonna become more dominant and have the relationship with the consumer. Uh, the next point we see is the, the power of internal communications. I mean, we just we did a, a big session with uh, Satya actually in London um, two three weeks ago, um, which was the decoded conference. Yes, yeah. but it was partly external, but it was mainly yeah. internal actually. And uh, I think the biggest challenge that uh, chairman and CEOs and CEOs face uh, in trying to run companies, particularly in a model like us, which is multi-branded and is grown by acquisition. Uh, is much easier in a single branded company that's going organically is to explain strategic and structural change internally. <coughs> so David Ogilvy wrote about this 50 years ago. I mean, most of what we do, in fact, I would say more than 50% of what we do, is aimed internally rather than externally. So getting people on side uh, uh, internally is critically important. Now, I'm sure that this <coughs> doesn't apply to anybody in this room, but outside this room, you know, it is amazing what human beings can do to, to subvert strategic purpose in cycles. Right? The silos, the functional silos, the geographic silos, 
that work against one another internally. I mean, I, I joke about it inside WPP. Uh, well, I don't joke about it, I'm deadly serious. When I say go left, everybody goes right. <laughs> so, so I figured out if I want them to go right, I say go left, and that's the way they go. But yeah. it's really a big <coughs> issue, really a big issue. So for, for chairman and CEOs, particularly CEOs, if you have a split function like we did in the UK, um, particularly for CEOs to get companies to move in the right, in a, right. and I, I would say that's the biggest, that's the biggest opportunity. CEOs with strong visions. I mean, our best clients, frankly, our client, our CEOs with have very strong visions, simple ones, with CMOs who share the vision and implement them. That's where we have the greatest success. Where we have, where we have the least success and the most friction is where that is not explicit. You know, I'll give you M Mulally at Ford as an example, one Ford. Now Mark Fields taking the mantle, together with Jim Farley, he was hired from uh, Toyota, actually, uh, six, seven years ago, five, six years ago, to come in as the CMO. Very good. Lou Gerstner at IBM will be another very good example, with Abby Constant in the early days, and then Parmesan with uh, Abby Constant and John Iwata. Good, good examples of very strong CEOs with clear visions, with CMOs to back it up. And, you know, going back to those average life statistics of five years and two years for CMOs, uh, it's increasingly important in that context. Mm -hmm. The next thing, I, uh, I apologize for this because this may not please some people in the room with regional responsibility, but what we notice, we've been writing about this in the annual report we do, the annual report we do lovingly, it's a uh, Warren Buffett's, um, it's a, war, a poor man's Warren Buffett, basically, if you read the Berkshire Hathaway report, it's an attempt to mimic what he does been doing it for 28 years, and um, we've been writing about this for about six or seven years, and it's finally coming to pass. Well, our belief was that, that corporate structures would be simplified, partly because of that cost pressure I mentioned. And Jeff Immel actually is the best example of this. At the Microsoft conference this year, he talked really uh, eloquently about what he was doing to his structures, and, and he's changing the structure of GE. And by the way, this is replicated four or five other clients. Global is becoming uh, smaller in terms of number of people, more agile, more networked, more technologically uh, balanced, or uh, more technological infrastructure, uh, but it's becoming uh, more powerful. Because of the number of countries that companies work in, we work in 111, uh, Mutar Kent always says that Coca-Cola works in 222. Whenever I see Mutar, I say, Mutar, there aren't 222 countries in the world. So a bit like you when you're at the Olympic Games, you know, and you, you see them walking around with their flags in the opening ceremony, you've got the independent, independent state of somewhere you've never heard of, right? But he's in 222. It's impossible sitting in Atlanta, or indeed for us in London, or in Singapore, to know what goes on in 111 countries. So what you have is global becoming more important, but more, more agile local becoming more important, not the rise of country managers in the old sense, but you know, we, we, we've got country managers now in 50 of the 111, or regional managers in 50 of the 111 countries we operate in, with the, the objective of getting them to focus on people, on local clients, and on acquisitions. Because you have to have a, a local uh, an, a knowledge, which you can't get at the center. What's happened to regional, however, it's been taken out. And Imelt spoke about this, and it was very persuasive. You know, Microsoft had a, a tremendous conference every year, which Bill Gates initiated, and Steve does, and now Satchit does. And um, it's a, it, you get about 100, 125 CEOs from, from the top companies, and, it, and there are about three or four companies in the room that are doing the same thing. So global becoming more important, local becoming more important, and regional. And what Imelt said, and <coughs> So to some this might sound unfair, but it's what he said. He said, regional has the power to say no, not the power to say yes. So they block stuff coming down and block stuff coming up. And uh, it's very interesting that, that they in GE are doing that. So they're going to become 19 business units. Uh, because I remember it was here at the summit, uh, Singapore summit two years ago, John Rice who runs GE internationally. 19 business units, functional geographical reporting. And the other thing is directly to the center. 
Now, the other thing, that's really, this was interesting yesterday in Jakarta too. So, what's happened uh, recently is Brazil's been taken out of the regional, Russia's been taken out of the regional, India's been taken out of the re regional, and China's been taken out of the regional, which is totally logical. Because why would you run countries of that size with a, a country manager and treat them just like you would Portugal or Greece? There's no sense to it at all. In fact, the other reverse would probably make sense. If you've got 20, uh, 32 states in uh, territories in, in China, 27 in India, whatever it is, 27 <coughs> in Brazil, you'd break them down uh, to, to get them into sort of parity with Portugal and Greece, not consolidate. Same thing was said in relation to Indonesia yesterday. Really interesting. A couple of our clients says Indonesia tends to be run out of Singapore by the regional management. And it's 250 million people, 90% Muslim. I mean, if you look at the population projections, Indonesia will be the third biggest market in the world by population, India being bigger than China in 20, 25 years' time. So what, what you should do is take Indonesia out. So if you think about it, and have it separate as a direct report. The Indonesians would say that because they would. See, very interesting because the Muslim population presents tremendous marketing opportunities, say, for example, in package goods and in, and in financial as well, that give you an, an opportunity that if it's agglomerated in the way in regional, so there's another example, another reason why regional is becoming a sort of less important in many people's minds or some people's minds. Next issue we see is the rise of finance and procurement. I mentioned it, no need to go any further on it. It's, it's to do with lack of inflation and pricing power and the post layman era. And this, in my view, is, is here to stay in the financial services area because of the regulators here, here to stay in terms of the government, etc. Uh, but also because I don't think worldwide economic conditions, I don't want to be gloomy, but it, it, it's, you know, Christine Lagarde is right, it's mediocre growth. There's no reason I can see in the short to medium term why we break out of this four and a half, five percent top line growth of the world. So the world's 72 trillion of GDP, US is 16, China's nine, uh, EU as a whole is 16. Then you go down to uh, Japan's about five and a half, I think it is. Germany's about three and a half. And then the five economies of Europe. Germany, UK, France, Italy, Spain, all around two, two and a half, three and a half uh, as individual economies. But I don't see they're going to break out of this sub-trend growth, sub-trend meaning sub, sub below where we were pre labor uh, The next point is government, here to stay, thank goodness, um, <laughs> British government, Australian government, the EU, amongst our biggest clients around the world, quite extraordinary. I mean, the, communications challenges and opportunities uh, for governments are very consider considerable, but it's like 1929, really. Government stayed with us until World War II. I'm not suggesting we have World War III to, to change things, but government as not just a regulator, but investor, stimulator, uh, and as communicator. I mentioned state sustainability. <coughs> None of the companies we deal with pay lip service to sustainability anymore. Um, CSR is at the is at the center of everything we do. So uh, John Brown, not fashionable to quote, um, ex-BP CEO, but he said it in 1997 at Stanford Business School, doing good is good business. It's as simple as that. Uh, you can forget about everything else in my view. Uh, we over-intellectualize it. We know that consumers like companies that are environmentally responsible. We know that people like, people who work inside companies, we know from our own experience. So sustainability is front and center. And the last point, just want to quickly mention, it's come back to in a way where I started, this, this question about consolidation. Consolidation because of the low growth world and because there's a finite limit to what you can do on cost, the recent mini boom in M&A is an example, I think, of companies running out of room, sort of room to maneuver on cost. So let's acquire a company because that's a cost opportunity. I mean, it's tax inversion in some cases, but it, in addition, it's reducing cost. And the two models that really trouble me in a way, uh, and we work for, for, for what well, one of them, we work for 3G, uh, the Brazilians, is it's, but the problem with it is it's too cost focused. Um, you know, when they took over Heinz, so, so just to remind you, 
Jorge Lehman and his partners at 3G. They control uh, Ambev, uh, Anheuser Busch, etc. They control Heinz, Burger King, uh, and one or two other things that people really don't know about. But there will be more. I'm willing to bet. Um, and you remember that this funny little Englishman said this and was wrong. But I'm willing to bet that you will see a couple of major packaged goods acquisitions by uh, the 3G group, funded by Buffett. And it was at the Microsoft conference again that we asked Buffett two years ago uh, why did he, he was interviewing Paul Hay Layman, who rarely makes public appearances, semi public appearances, why he did it. And he said, Well, I had the best manager in the world. Because if you remember, he paid 17 billion for Heinz. Um, and uh, he you know, which was a, not a terribly high price, but pretty high price. And he the, immediately the Brazilian management said that they would, and the margins weren't bad, they were about 13, 14, 15 percent. Brazilian management said they would get them to 23 percent, which they have largely done by, by ripping out cost. And some would say even going further than that, going for marketing spending cut and all that sort of thing. And so Buffett said, well, I've got the best manager in the world. I'm buying utilities, tomato, ketchup, and baked beans, and I can go into the, the, the long markets, <coughs> the financial markets, and borrow at rates that I never thought possible. I'll give you an example from WPP. We borrowed last year in the 30-year market. The 30-year bond market was not created for advertising agencies. It was created for shipping companies or energy companies. So we borrowed at 5.6%. We thought we were heroes for 30 years. That's gross cost, so net cost is about three, three and a half. So you could buy a company at about 33 times earnings without feeling the heat, at least in theory. This year, we could do it at 5.1. This year, we went into the 12-year 12 12 year euro market at 2.25% gross. So almost 1% net, which means you could buy a company at 100 times earnings without feeling it. And then we went into the dollar market 10 years at 3.35, I think it was. So incredible, I mean, absolutely incredible. And Buffett's taking advantage. That's why I think there will be other major transactions because rates will stay lower longer. You know, you've got the Americans coming out of QE, but you've got the Japanese going into QE, and you've got um, you've got uh, Europe Draghi doing doing the same. <coughs> Chinese lowering interest rates. So this lower longer rate thing is going to uh, carry on with us. But this industry consolidation. The worst example is Valiant. Valiant has now been unsuccessful. Thank goodness. In acquiring Allegan, I think Active, they're going to do the deal with Activist. Um, but uh, Valiant is already $50 billion. It's run by an ex McKinsey consultant who made his reputation in the pharmaceutical industry. The pharmaceutical industry. So he went around to all the pharmaceutical companies and gave them advice on what they should do. So, what is Valiant? Valiant is a company that is totally based on acquisitions. Uh, so, no organic growth, really, basically. And uh, it's an ex CFO, the CFO is an ex Goldman guy, a very good guy, somebody we know quite well. And it's been very aggressive on acquisition. What it does, it get, buys, it, it makes offers for pharmaceutical companies, 50 billion market cap. Allegan would have been another 50 billion, making it 100 billion, which made it very big in the pharmaceutical sector. And it buys these companies and then rips out all R&D costs. Now, if you've ever heard of a pharmaceutical company that doesn't do R&D, I mean, that, to my mind, is an oxymoron. And it's totally short, short term focus. But it did get traction. You may have seen that um, Aikman, the hedge fund operator, backed, uh, backed uh, uh, Valiant in its, in its attempted raid on Allegan. They made a $2 billion <coughs> profit on the deal with, with the Aquilus company. And $400 million of that goes to the, to the, to the management of Valiant. So I, I just mentioned this. You're, you're going to see more clients consolidating. You're going to see more media owners consolidating, and you might even see it in our industry more because, in a low growth environment with the emphasis on cost, it's, it's very much there. And then, just last, I just let you dwell one second on what the impact of the internet on consumers. Um, so, we, we, we follow this, uh, it's related to a number of the points I've tried to make this morning. So, if you look at the time spent by consumers, for example, in the US, versus where we're investing our money. When I say we, not WPP, I'm talking about our industry, you see some, some very interesting changes. The, the first is in print. Um, 
5% of consumer time in traditional print. So felling trees, distributing newsprint, <coughs> right, the traditional stuff, newspapers and magazines. 5% of time, but we still invest 19% of budgets in print. At the other end, uh, internet and mobile, 45% of time, and we invest 26%. The internet spending is, is pretty much in, in line, but mobile is too, far too low. So you, the two things you're going to see even more of is switch from traditional print to internet and mobile. In those statistics, internet and mobile includes digital print and digital TV, or seven screen, or eight screen TV. Radio actually is about right, 12% time spent, 10% invested, um, so that's about, that's about okay. TV for the first time, this is the real point, TV for the first time is showing a discrepancy in the latest data. So 38% of time spent, 45% of investment in traditional free-to-air. So the prediction, uh, which is very controversial and the free-to-air networks hate us saying this, um, the prediction is that free-to-air is going to come under not the same pressure as newspapers, traditional news, uh, newspapers and magazines, but is going to come under pressure. And we're starting to see for the first time, I mean there's some very interesting things <coughs> that came out in the UK uh, last week, which is number of TV sets in the whole households kids watching TV, a number of sets that they're exposed to, time obviously, you know, you know like from your own kids or grandkids, uh, you see what they're doing. But this is, so TV, I'm not saying go the same way as traditional um, print, print and magazines and newspapers, but it's showing signs of, of significant change. So, that's it. Okay? Mm -hmm. Questions? Questions and discussion? Okay.